Welcome to worship. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. I'm going to take a breath for a second. How about we all uh, rise to our feet? Take some time to greet our neighbors. You know, during that time, we're, we're starting this where we just kind of have some songs before the service starts. And that's still an opportunity. In fact, it's encouraged for you all to still fellowship because that's so important. I imagine in heaven we're going to have plenty of opportunity to be fellowshipping and singing and praising. Father, as we come before you this morning, we just ask that you come and soften our hearts and help us to uh, just become humble before you. Help us to use this time as an opportunity to just draw a direct connection with you. Father, we're all blessed to be able to come before you as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters, just to lift your name up and sing praises to you, God. We just ask that uh, heaven comes to touch earth in this room right now. Beautiful, sweet melody, sounding. 
you know, as we bring an offering of praise, the angels are surrounding in heaven. Fallen saints are up there singing as we sing. Just think about that for a minute. sing from your heart. You can shout it out. You can lift your hands in praise. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. welcome you to worship this morning and um, just want to share a few things with you at this time before we um, sing another song together this morning. And a couple of things. One, just want to remind you, details for this are in the bulletin. Kathy's run uh, May 11th. Um, if you want to run on the WPC team, you can let Holly know. Um, Tim, is Tim here this morning? I think I saw Tim. There he is over there. So um, it's a run in honor of uh, Kathy. She was a member here and uh, impactful member in our community as well. So we'd love for you to be part of honoring her life um, on that day. Uh, so just let Holly know and she'll um, set you up. And um, speaking of Holly, she's actually going to share a few things. We are one week out uh, from Hands and Feet, our mission auction fundraiser. And we just wanted to spend a couple minutes this morning making sure you're aware of all of the live auction items um, that are there so that you come prepared knowing uh, what is going to be there. We'll have basket auctions, we'll have food, we'll have fun, we'll have all that good stuff. We're just going to spend a minute here today to encourage you to get your tickets today. We need to sell tickets. It's, the event is one week from today. So Holly, go ahead. Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. So who has plans on Cinco de Mayo? Me. I want to see more hands. <laughs> Um, we would love for you to come out and help support our DR missions trip. We are having um, the hands and feet dinner um, at the Elmer Grange. And like Aaron said, we have basket auctions and we have some pretty awesome live auction items as well. So just wanted to go over those a little bit. Um, we have a four night stay at the Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge over Martin Luther King weekend in 2020. Um, value is $1,600. Uh, we have a dream vacation. A one-week stay, your choice at any Wyndham Vacation Resort. There's 108 locations. Uh, let's see here. Dinner for eight at the Coleman Farm. Sounds delicious. It's farm to table. We also have a tour of the museum at the Philadelphia Art Museum for a family of four, or for four guests, I guess you would say. Um, a chartered boat ride to the Chesapeake City. And a fishing trip option is available for that as well. So um, I'm excited to be bidding on these, and hopefully... You are too. You'll be coming out. Um, we have these flyers available in the back for more information. And if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to Aaron, Lisa, or myself as well. So hope to see you there. <laughs> 
Thank you, Holly. And uh, just one correction in that. The Philadelphia Museum Art Tour is for three, not four. That's a typo on there, so sorry about that. Um, but join us a week from today, Elmer Grange, 4 o'clock. We would love to have you. We need your support to make this year's uh, trip an awesome trip. We have 19 members. Um, over half of those members are community members from other churches partnering with our church. So we're excited about this. You'll get to see a few faces, learn more about what the team will be doing this summer, and also enjoy each other's awesome company, too. Um, so, John, I think last thing, you have something to share, and then I we do. can... I do. Brothers, men, guys, we are having a movie night where we get to come together as leaders in the kingdom of God and watch a movie called Kingdom and Rising. And it's a, it's a movie um, about guys stepping up and taking action in the kingdom of God. And we have, uh, we, we had 20, 25 tickets and we're about halfway there. So um, seek out myself after the service or Dan after the service um, or we'll seek you out. Um, and uh, the tickets are $12. We're, we're meeting here at 6, but if you're closer, it's in Seoul. So if you're closer to Seoul, you can meet us there. The movie starts at 7 o'clock. But uh, here's a trailer to give you a little insight to it. The catastrophe of manhood has reached every segment of our society. If you're not serving in the kingdom, then you're really not a servant of Christ. We're going to either build the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of this earth. We have to choose which one we're going to fit in and which one we're going to do. I think the biggest challenge we have is being a man of God today is so far off society's norm. We own this. We own the responsibility of calling a culture in decline back, calling men back. Did you hear what the man said? <laughs> All right, as we do this, uh, do, do the, this last song, we're going to do one more. I just want to uh, share with you and encourage you, like, during, during our time of worship here, um, there's no rule that says you have to stand or, or, or sit or anything like that. The, the, the call is to do what you feel you're being led to do. If you need to sit down and pray, I see, see that happening often. You can do that. If you need to stand up and shout praises, you're welcome to do that. Open arms, lifting hands. Whatever you feel the Holy Spirit is calling you to do in that moment to glorify God, you are encouraged to do that. Amen. Amen. Breathe. We live for you, 
Lord, we live for you.
our voices and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken amen have a seat. church. Good morning again. Did everybody have a, a good Easter? We were just together a week ago and we were kicking off this resurrection effect. We were talking about um, what happens in the resurrection, what changes, <clears throat> what is the kind of lasting um, effect of that. And actually um, the very first verse that comes right after what Dan read for us is exactly what we were just singing. It says, and there is, no sal there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter's words in Acts. The effects of the resurrection, so what are they? How many are there? There's probably like an endless list of things that we could come up with, stories we could tell. Uh, one of the words we're going to take a look at today, I'm going to introduce in just a moment, but I'm going to start with a question. And don't answer this out loud, but just think about it. Um, what do you call those types of questions? Rhetorical, right. I was thinking derogatory. I knew that was the wrong word. I'm not going to ask you a derogatory question. Um, but think about what is something bold that you have done? Like one of the most bold things you have done. Maybe it's something small. Maybe it's something big. Um, but think and try to remember a time you have been bold. Um, I was reminded of uh, growing up a Giants fan in the Philadelphia area. And um, my dad taught me boldness and being a Giants fan. I was reminded of that this week. Holly's sister, she used to be a member here before she moved to Texas. And here's a picture of her son, right? Isn't he a cutie? Can you see that? He's so cute. I know it's a little shaded. And you know, how many of you had a car like this for your kids, right? Anybody remember these? You push them or they have to move like their feet on the bottom, right? Now I want to remind you um, that this little cutie pie lives in Texas. And this is what they did to his car. Ready? Show us the next couple pictures. Football weight, it gets better gets better. Eagles, right? So literally, <laughs> exactly. But literally, I saw this post on Facebook, and I said to Kathleen, right? Am I getting the right sister? I was afraid I was going to. I said to Kathleen in a comment, that is a bold thing to do living in Texas, right? So think of um, this concept of kind of being bold. We're going to talk about this. This is our word this week um, that I want you to think about for the resurrection, boldness, right? Uh, last week, we actually talked about the response to the resurrection. We talked about um, some of the reversals, the, re the effect, the reversal of the resurrection. And um, if you were here last week, you might remember I mentioned Lee Strobel and his rush to reason and kind of all of the reasons um, in his research that led to him becoming a believer. And one of the things he talked about, and I mentioned for you, were all of the testimonies to how the disciples who followed Jesus endured such persecution, beatings, imprisonment up until death 
for proclaiming the resurrection, for doing exactly what we see Peter doing here this morning, for um, having this kind of proof, right? Um, as Strobel says, proof that there was boldness in what they stood for. They stood for the gospel. They stood for the resurrection. They kept telling the story of Jesus. They didn't back down. So one of the effects, if not um, probably for me, one of the greatest effects is this boldness. Another word might be courage, right? That there was no watered down gospel. There was no changing up what happened in the face of leadership who was persecuting and threatening the disciples. They told the story. They kept telling the story. There was no backing down. There was no avoiding it. As a matter of fact, we see that boldness becomes the mark of a believer, the very mark of a believer. I love one of the commentaries states it like this. It's the hallmark of a Jesus spirit filled follower, the hallmark of a Jesus spirit filled follower. The word boldness that we see and are going to see, because we're going to keep reading a little bit more in Acts 4 today throughout the text is the word parhesia, frankness, outspokenness, courage, often translated as boldness. So I want to keep going because we're going to hear it a few times. You kind of got the setting um, for you. Dan read it um, as we were singing our final song. And so here you kind of get this idea. The disciples, Peter, and some of them are before uh, Jewish leaders who want them to stop talking about what has happened. They just want to shush them. They want to put this uh, to bed, and they are threatening them to do this. So picking up right where I just left off, Acts 4, verse 13. Let's keep reading. It says, now when they saw the boldness, so they are the persecutors, they are the ones threatening, saw the boldness, of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But not seeing the man who was healed stand beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So here we get this little insight. They're totally astonished by the boldness of Peter and of John and of the other disciples. And it has nothing to do with their education level, right? It's not their seminary degree. It's not their years of teaching and preaching and training. It's not their volunteer work. It's not um, their doctorate or their master's, right? It is the boldness that they have in, fa- in, in front and facing those who are coming up against them, who are trying to quiet them. So what scripture tells us here is that they are astonished by the frankness, by the outspokenness, and by the courage. And they were speechless because of it. And so we see this picture here, and we see this throughout Acts. This is one example today of the disciples' boldness in the face of opposition and persecution. So let's keep reading. So, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? What shall we do with these bold men who won't stop doing what we're telling them to stop doing? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Right, so we see the attempt to silence them. We see the attempt to control them, to restrict them, to make it so this story and the power in the story doesn't go any further. We see that they can't deny what is happening. Right, a man stands before them healed, changed, and they have no other explanation for it. And so here, the leaders attempt to use their power and their authority to stop this gospel and truth from moving. We don't want this story of the resurrection to go further. We don't want to spread the truth because we see its power, and it's threatening our power, and we don't like it, and they were terrified. So what do you think? You think Peter and John backed down? We wouldn't be sitting here today if they did. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We cannot not speak. We cannot be silent. We cannot listen to you over God. We cannot fail to be bold in the name of Jesus. We cannot disregard the truth of what we have seen, of what we have known, of what we have lived, the power of the truth. The source of our boldness is the resurrection alive in us. This is their response to the threats. 
but it's not over. We keep reading. In Acts, it tells us, and when they had further threatened them, so they kept going, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So they threaten them, they try to stop them in their tracks, but they just, they don't have any luck, they can't stop them. As a matter of fact, around them they see all of these people are praising God and that the truth was on their side and boldness filled them. It actually marked them. But how do the believers respond? Because there's one more part in Acts 4 that we're going to read together this morning. Because what's their response? Do they retaliate? Do they threaten back? Do they get violent? Do they persecute them? Do they try to take them out? No. Never once do we see them focus on the very one attacking them or persecuting them or trying to stand in their way. Here's what they do. And this is important. It says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they read this part with me. They lifted their voices together to God. What is that called? They prayed. And here's what they said. Here's the prayer. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The king of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever you ha- your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, here's the petition, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your words with all, I can't hear you, what did you say? While you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with? That's like four times we've seen this word. They got together. Did they pray that God would take out their enemy? Did they pray that God would silence their enemy? Did they pray that God would even convert the hearts of their enemy? Not in this moment, maybe at other times. In this time, here they are facing persecution and threats against their life, and their prayer is for more, what is it? Boldness. Boldness. That's incredible. Prayer is what empowers the disciples for mission. They get together, they're in unity, they're giving thanksgiving, they're praising, and they lift their voices together, they pray, but when they pray, they pray for boldness. Because boldness was the mark of those radical followers of Jesus. Marked by the Holy Spirit, emboldened to be outspoken, to be courageous, to tell the story. So what do we learn from this? Because here's kind of my thought, is that we have a tendency here, we kind of read scripture like this, and we sit together in church this morning, we're like, yeah, those disciples, they were really bold. And then we come up with like a laundry list of things and reasons as to why our situation or our context is different. As to why it doesn't really call for the same thing. And so this morning, I, want to, I wonder if we were to look at this and we were to kind of dissect it and say, what things do we have in common? In what ways are we different? And where does that kind of leave us here this morning? Because do we have anything in common with the early believers? Do you guys think we have anything in common with the early? You can answer this one, do you? We do, right? I mean, are we not following the same Jesus? Are we not proclaiming the same resurrection? Are we not filled with the same Holy Spirit? but do we have their boldness? And I will be the first one to say that when I look in the mirror this week, as I'm thinking about this word, I go, no, I do not have that boldness. So the source of their boldness, the context of their boldness, and then the result of their boldness are the things that I want to look at today and challenge us um, each individually. Like, are we connected to that source? Maybe the one thing that is different from us is our context. Just like that would be different from believers around the world, but shouldn't the results be the same? So what's the source of the boldness? 
I mean, the source, we see it happen here in prayer, is what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and their faith community is really the source of their boldness, right? They're, asked, um, they're asking in prayer for power, for boldness. The story of Jesus the resurrection, the resurrected Christ, the fact that they were with him, they saw him die, they went to the tomb, he wasn't there, and then they saw him alive and then ascend. And so this is what fuels their boldness, their ministry. So if you and I are not as bold as Peter and John and Stephen and those that we will read about in Acts, that would go before us, that would establish the early church, then we have to ask something about our source. Our, what's going on with our source? Is the Holy Spirit not as powerful as it was in Acts? Has, has the power of God declined? Is there something about our prayer? Is it that we don't have a story to tell? Is it that we have fallen into a tendency where we rely on ourselves instead of where we rely on the power of God? And I wonder sometimes if our source of boldness becomes ourselves when we get stuck. So this morning, the first thing that I ask us to think about is that source of boldness. And do we really believe that we have the same source that Peter and John have in this story? The same source of truth and the same source of power. And how does that fit into our context? Because I think that's pretty important, too. I mean, think about the context of boldness in which these disciples are in. It is different from our context. Can we all agree with that? Do you think we face the same things exactly that Peter and John faced? I mean, what were they, in, what were they facing? They were in front of what? They were threatened by leaders, by crowds. They were in prison. They were persecuted. They were punished. I mean, ultimately, these early disciples, a couple hundred of them that began and then grew and multiplied, right? were the enemy of Rome and of the Jews, the two powerhouses. Everywhere they looked, you're either going to see Jews or you're going to see Romans, and they're now their enemies. They were the major players at the time, and they stood up to them, and it cost them their lives, almost all of them that we know of. So I guess then, if our source is the same, but our context is so drastically different, then why do we lack boldness? Is it fear? Is it, you know, that fear of being rejected? of inviting somebody to something and somebody saying no? Or is it, is it a fear that people will think we're different or we're silly for what we believe? Is it a fear of being wrong? Maybe it has to, maybe our context is so closely associated with our source because we are really not sure where we stand and we don't have the same kind of conviction. I mean, think about it. Just a few chapters later in Acts, here's the type of context that these guys were in. In Acts chapter 12, it, tells, it says this, about that, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. There are violent hands that come against them. They are being killed and they are being arrested. This is what happens. As a matter of fact, later when Paul is, after Saul becomes Paul and he's converted and he's um, building churches and traveling all over, in his second letter to the Corinthians, he describes it. And I wonder how many of us would describe our own faith journey anywhere near the way Paul described his. You probably know this. 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again, all right? So just keep your hands up if you've been in prison for your faith, if you've been flogged, or if you've been exposed to death. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Are you following Paul's journey? How many of you can identify? Have I been, have I been constantly on the move? Have I been, now listen to this word, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. That is a lot of danger. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. What does your, look, your list look like? Because, man, when I read this, I can't even pick up a pencil and paper. 
What have we endured for the gospel? And so I ask again, where is your boldness as a believer? What's the source? In what context? It's almost impossible to talk about this. It's, I, I find it impossible to talk about this and not think about the worldwide church, right? And so, yes, our boldness is going to look different. I am not trying to encourage us this morning to go out and seek persecution and seek imprisonment and try to get ourselves into the same context. What I'm trying to do is have us address our own context with the source of which we identify with, the source being the power of the Holy Spirit, being our personal relationship with Christ, being the way we are changed and transformed in life by the resurrection, and that that would inspire us in our boldness and our context. Because when I read Paul's letters, when I read the stories in Acts, I think just like me, we're aware, aren't we? Are you aware that this still happens, that there are people in this world, fellow believers who can identify with this context? And I just want to share a story this morning. There's a couple of stories. There's a, a ministry that I follow, um, Open Doors, uh, they're called. And they make a lot of videos about the persecuted church throughout the world. Um, one of their ministry right now is most prevalent in North Korea. Um, there, and I'll tell you, if you're interested and you want to learn more and you want to see more of these stories and really be inspired, um, you can check them out. Just Google Open Doors and you'll, they'll come up. There's a whole bunch of them. I'm going to share one with you this morning um, from a young teenager um, and in Iraq. And he, I just want you to see his story of boldness in his context. هذه غرفتي وأنا دخلها بأجر بايو وأي ملاعب كلها يعني تبلاها تبلي و وبيش أبشر وأي غرفة بيش أبشر عنده أنا على جزء ااا كشاوك لي مندي بيش أقوي آخر ااا روح أتقطش بيش أبشر عنده من أبطاج لولع بشر عنده من من يعني من بشطور من دعا خلني أنا كبن دعا من كلمة شك بن بلطان خارج أنا كبن بيش المدرس دد أنا دد مل بن أطفال زورة So it's a different context, but the same source. You know, he doesn't say that he's not afraid to move back because something has changed in his context. He says he's not afraid to move back because he has the Holy Spirit that makes him bold, that makes him courage, that gives him courage, right? So where is your boldness? This is a question I've been asking myself all week. Think about the result of the boldness in the early church. You cannot read through the early chapters, the beginning stories in Acts, without reading things like they added to their numbers daily. Thousands came to believe, right? You see healings. You see blind men that can see, sick that are made healthy, raised from the dead, crippled who could walk. You see the results of their boldness. Lives are changed. As a matter of fact, the result of the boldness of the early church was that the world was changed because the story of the resurrected Christ was told boldly in the face of persecution, in the face of death. It was told boldly. 
As a matter of fact, the resurrection made it to you and me because of their boldness. Do you ever stop to think about that? Like, where would we be if Peter and John just said, you know what, you're right, we're just going to go hide somewhere. This is too scary. We can't do this. We're not willing to risk our comfort zones. We're not willing to give up our families. We're not willing to give up our lives. What if Paul had said, that's just one beating too many? I just can't take it one more time. And just surrendered. And the story just stopped. If the threats worked. If the beatings and the imprisonment and the death stopped the gospel, where would we be? I mean, who would have told us about Jesus? As a matter of fact, every single one of you here probably has some story of boldness, no matter how little it is about how you got to the place that you are. Maybe it was your parents who were bold in their faith and took you to church and raised you. Maybe it was a friend who was bold in her faith and invited you um, and risked you saying no risked you rejecting her or him to be here this morning or to be in this church or in this place. Maybe it was a youth director or a children's ministry director when you were growing up who shared that story with you. The result of boldness. It's interesting, isn't it? Because our source and our results should be the same. I mean, the details of the results may look different, while the context, the thing in the middle, changes around. But ultimately, what we're saying is that fueled by the Holy Spirit, with the power of Christ, we can speak the truth of a God who came and walked and lived and died and rose for you and me. I love when we see Peter tell the story in Acts. And this isn't the only time. There's different versions of this throughout this book. But he doesn't ever shy away. You notice he uses pronouns like that man who you killed. That man who you put to death. He never backs down. Not only does he tell the truth about what happened as far as Jesus resurrecting, but he tells the truth about the Romans and the Jews and the leaders and their role in it. He just boldly says it. And the result of that is that people are praising God. People cannot deny the boldness and the truth that is there. And the world is forever changed. You and I are forever changed. So here's what I want to do this morning as we wrap up. I want to share with you a story of boldness. So I'm going to invite uh, Anita Zastro up. She's an elder here. A lot of you might know Anita. She might have um, prayed with you at some time or reached out to you at some time. And I asked her if she would share a really kind of simple story. Because I think what I don't want to do this morning is look at the um, radical boldness of the disciples and the radical boldness in the persecuted church and then try to, like, leave us figuring out where are we in that. So Anita happened to tell me this story a couple weeks ago. And it just kind of came up this week, and I thought this is such a great example of what just simple boldness can look like and how it can impact a life. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. I think we'll try this mic. Is that, is that good, Bill? All right. Come on out here so they can, they can see you. So I asked Anita just to share this story. And just let me know if you have the email up there. So if you want it up, Sue okay. can put it up. Okay. Good morning. I have been a part of the healing ministry here at our church since I think we've been going on about four or five years. And through that, we've had some really exciting things happen, um, especially recently. So I'm really excited um, because soon we're going to be hearing testimonies about those things that have happened. And I think they have helped me with my boldness. Um, Joe and Allison, who I know, have... Uh, have had some very interesting experiences with sensitivity issues, chemical, electrical, etc. So recently, um, Dave and I were blessed to go to Panama, the country of Panama, and we're on a plane, and Dave has the aisle, I have the middle. He's informed me before we go, I'm going to be working on my presentation, so I bring, I bring my magazines, my tablets, I got books, I got earphones to watch stuff, I'm, I'm all set. And I see this man walk down the aisle with this kind of unique head thing on. Um, and he happens to sit next to me at the window. And so I go back to doing my thing. And then God says to me, speak to the man. And I'm like, oh, I think I didn't hear that right. I'm just going to, got this really good book. I'm going to read it here. And, the God, and God says again, speak to the man. So I say, 
And God, what am I supposed to speak to him about? And he says, he has electrical sensitivity issues. And you're going to pray for him today. And I'm like, I'm going to talk to Dave first. <laughs> so see, I'm not so bold. Um, but God kept nudging me and nudging me. So I looked over at the man and I said, by this time he has this thing on his head. He now has a shroud around his body. It's silver. His legs are shaking. Um, I know something is going on with him. So I said to him, can I ask you a question? And I said, do you have electrical sensitivity issues? And he looks at me like a deer in the headlights. And he said, how in the world did you know? And I said, I didn't. God did. And he said, do you know how many people in the world even know about this? And what are the chances that you would sit next to me on this plane today? So we begin a conversation. His name is Dr. Carlos Sosa. He is from Colombia. He worked in the emergency room at a hospital. His disease has progressed to the point that he has not worked in over six years. At one point, it became so bad that he lived in the jungle. He could not even live in the city. And um, he shared with me personal stories about his health, the journey he's been on, what had happened recently to a very good friend of his. And so I began to pray. I just said to him, I'm going to put my hand on your arm, and I'm going to pray. And when we prayed, I also introduced him today, by the way, some point, point in time during this. <laughs> um, his shaking stopped. The shroud that he had put around him, his body came down, and he took the headdress off. Now, he told me that landings were the very worst of, of her flights for him, takeoffs and landings. And as we landed... You know, I just had my hand. We were talking and praying. We exchanged emails. We had some more conversations. I told him how especially God was fond of him because he had sent me on this trip just so that I could sit next to him and speak to him and to bring him hope because as I looked at this man, he looked lifeless. He looked desperate. He looked very, very sad. And so we had a great conversation. He gave me his email. I gave him my email. And we've been corresponding back and forth. He's had a lot of situations that he's working through um, outside of even this and everything. So um, you, can, you can put it up now. So um, back and forth conversations. And this is the email that I got this last Monday. I'm sorry. It's very overwhelming to me. So this is the man who was desolate and thinking about taking his own life. And this is, this is the email that I got um, from him this Monday. And he's telling me that he's now exercising five to six times a week. And that he feels happy. And then he hopes to be going back to work after not doing it. So this is just one little plane ride and just God speaking and then just saying yes to what he's asking you to do. Thank you, Anita. I don't know about you, but I travel more like Dave. I work on the plane. So, I mean, when Anita and I were talking, I was really humbled by that because I'm like, man, I wonder how many opportunities I have missed. Thanks, babe. <laughs> we won't talk about your movie watching with your earbuds on the plane. Okay, so you heard it, folks. Who's in the DR team on the plane? No earbuds for Robert, right? But, um, but I love it. It's such a simple story. And that's, 
I think the challenge that I want for each one of us, that's what I've been wrestling with um, this week. And this is kind of an unfinished message, if you will, um, because I don't know the full answer to that. But I do know that it is um, a choice, right, to kind of position ourselves before God and say, God, how are you asking me to be bold? What is that relationship that you're calling me to speak into? Who is that person? Um, and I wonder if it happens kind of like this. If kind of like, you know, we would say this every time you go on a plane, you take advantage of the person sitting next to you as being someone that God has placed there intentionally, right? And so there's that. Now, I know some of you travel for work, so you might have just got your answer, right? Like you're on planes all the time. But what if we were just to ask that question on a daily basis? And what if we were to say at the end of each day, I look back and I go, how was I bold today? How did I boldly share what God has done? Because here's the thing. We, we either are hiding from something and we're not, you know, inviting the Holy Spirit to really empower us into boldness or we don't have a story to tell. And if that's the case, then your boldness needs to be asking somebody to share their story with you. Because Jesus has done something so radical in each of our lives and in each of our hearts. And we've experienced it. And I know, um, I've heard your stories, right? And I know... Um, some of you, not all of you, but I've heard some of your stories about what God has done. And I wonder if at the end of every day, that is our goal to just say, God, how was I bold for you today? What situation did I step out of my comfort zone? What situation did I rely only on the Holy Spirit and not on myself? Because it is so easy for me to get to the end of the week and look back and say, I've done all of these things, but how many of them were me? And how many of them were me just fully relying on God and just saying, I'm going to be bold in this moment? I'm not going to shy away from this conversation. I'm going to tell this person. I'm going to say this thing. I'm going to invite whatever it is. I can't give you that answer today. But like I said, I think this is an unfinished message that keeps going on and on. And it's not an accident that the week after we talk about the reversal, the permanent effect of the resurrection on our lives, the direction of our lives, our lives here on earth, our eternal lives, that we focus on the word boldness because that's what we see happening in the early church. They were so empowered and changed by what Jesus had done that they went out and changed the world. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful that I can stand here today because of the boldness of the early disciples. So where's your boldness? Maybe we could find it together. Maybe it would be our mark of being spirit-filled Jesus followers. Is that you? Are you a bold, spirit-filled Jesus follower? I want to claim to be, but I guess now I need to live like I am. Let us pray. God, our boldness does indeed come in you. You are the source, God. And I think probably many of us here have gotten so used to just walking through life, doing what we can do, achieving what we can do on our own, that there are just days that we don't even ask what you want to do in us or through us. We don't even make ourselves available. And maybe there are times that we have, maybe, God, we're afraid of failing or afraid of being rejected or afraid it won't come out right or we just don't know enough or we don't know how to tell our story or what if and we kind of spend all of our energy on this list. So God, help us, Lord, just put our hearts before you today. And as we close our um, time out together this morning with a song, I pray, God, that part of that song would be seeking um, a boldness in your spirit that is new to us. Asking, Lord, for you to empower us, to give us the words, Lord. Maybe that we need to stand in opposition of another claim. Maybe that we just need to invest in a person, not shy away from, seek those opportunities, whatever it is, God, we just pray for your boldness to be upon us. And God, I pray that there would be hearts here today that are just echoing that prayer. I pray that there would be more and more of us here every Sunday that say, this is more than just an hour where we come together, but we want this hour to change our days and our weeks and our lives and our community and our family and our world. We just seek your boldness here, God. We thank you, God, that you give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, we're going to ask the ushers to come forward as we take the offering.
We did this song uh, last week called Raise a Hallelujah. Raise a Hallelujah. And as Aaron was preaching, I'm thinking it takes boldness to raise a hallelujah in front of our enemies. To raise it louder than our unbelief.
Stick around for fellowship hour. and thank our full cup ladies for hosting this morning. Um, you're invited to stick around for that and grab your tickets on the way out. Uh, we'll have some of our team members there, I hope, selling tickets. And uh, we'd love to see you next Sunday afternoon. And I just want to challenge us all um, to be bold in our faith this week. And I'm wondering if we can share those stories with each other and those challenges and say to somebody, you know, here's where I'm struggling in my boldness. Will you help me? Will you pray for me? Will you encourage me? Will you hold me accountable here? So that just like the early disciples, the church in North Korea and China in Iraq and in all the places in the world that share that context, you know, just because we don't share their context does not mean that we cannot share their boldness. Amen? All right, let us go. Uh, Yes. Sorry, you're going to be very sorry you asked me to be bold. Okay. 